Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This morning, Mrs. Goldberg, Mr. Scarantino, and Dr. Lutinsky will answer the questions you have concerning our reopening for our elementary schools. Just a reminder to all of you, as of today, August 21st, Rynek is opening on September 8th on a hybrid model. The first day of instruction for students will be on Thursday, September 10th. September 8th and 9th are orientation days. You will be receiving more information from each of your schools explaining the details. And also another reminder, as the regional situation changes, Rynek will adjust accordingly. So thank you again for being here. And I wanna turn this over right now to uh, Dr. Lutinsky. Would you like to get started? Thanks, Dr. Ferraro. Uh, first, I'd like to point out to everyone we have on our screen, I'd like to make sure that you look at the first bullet. So if you'd like to ask questions during this presentation, please email Q&A at Rynek.org. Okay, please do not use the reopening at Rynek.org. That was uh, one uh, we had for our, our board meetings. So please use Q&A at Rynek.org. Uh, and we will try to do our best to respond to your emails as they come. So today's presentation focuses on our elementary schools, uh, but just to, to go back really quickly, when we first started examining how to reopen our guidance from New York State, asked us to focus on three different possibilities. One, which would be a, a full reopen, which means everybody back in school. The opposite would be full remote learning with everyone home. And the third would be a hybrid reopening which would consider social distancing. So we have been asked to, to open our schools and bring our kids back in, but with social distancing. So we have been asked, well, why don't we just bring everybody back in? Uh, because we've been specifically told we need to use social distancing. So there are some schools, some districts that have, uh, you know, enrollment in districts goes up and down over time. So some schools have high enrollment relatively, and some schools have low enrollment. Some schools have some extra space in their buildings. Uh, we do not have extra space in our buildings. So we can fit about half of our kids at a time using social distancing. Uh, if we had more space, we'd bring more kids back. So right now we're using our, our hybrid model. That's what we're set to do on September 8th. Uh, you will note that there's kind of a, a, fourth, a fourth option. You saw the district blast email outlining our optional remote plan. Remember, this is for uh, students who are uh, medically vulnerable and can't come in, or it's for students whose families do not feel comfortable sending them in. So the details are on, uh, on that uh, blast email, information about the plan, and also the link to sign up for the optional remote plan. We did get one question uh, between uh, then and now regarding, well, how do I know if I got it? Well, if you if you sign up on that Google form, you're in it. And what we're going to do is by school, we'll send you a confirmation so that you don't have to wonder about it. We will, we will confirm with you that your child is signed up for the optional remote plan. So when we use terms like social distancing, in here we're talking about six feet in between students. There are some variations with regards to uh, specifically music and physical education, which is uh, set at 12 feet. Uh, but usually we're talking about six feet when we say social distance. And then the other aspect of our hybrid model that's important is the, the cohort plan. So we have cohort one and cohort two. And all that means is we divided the school, the district really in half we were, we were respectful of families so that children, uh, families with multiple children, regardless of the grade spread, would have their children in the same cohort for convenience. So your children would be in either cohort one or cohort two. Uh, and lastly, on this page, uh, we did consider other models. You know, some districts are doing AMPM. Uh, AMPM brings the entire district in like cohort one and two on the same day, um, which we saw as a, uh, a dramatic drain on our 
our cleaning resources, our custodians are already going to be busy and that would put a, an enormous strain on them. Uh, others are doing uh, elementary and secondary splits. In other words, bringing in elementary students every day and secondary students, the older students, would be remote learning. Uh, we really didn't think that was, that was fair. There are uh, important aspects for in-person learning at all grade levels. Uh, we didn't think it fair to delineate and put one group at a disadvantage. So let's talk first about health and safety. Uh, you, you know, yes, we're an educational institution, and yes, our mission is to, to educate students, but for any of that to work, our students have to be healthy. Our staff has to be healthy. So that's mission one. So the first thing we have to do is, is screen people to make sure that if they come in the building, they're healthy. There's, there's different ways of doing that. One is something simple like the, the travel restriction reminder. And you'll see some of these things are really, you know, you know this is a community effort. So, so in the school, we're relying on families to adhere to the travel restriction. We're, we're looking for families to be, and, and staff members to be honest about, do you feel sick before you come to school in the morning? So a lot of this is, um, you know, trusting one another. That's important. But the travel restriction, if you're, if you're in a spot that by, by New York State is under one of those quarantine restrictions, then you should be back in town prior to 14 days before the start of school. Number one. Uh, the second bullet there regards sick students and staff. You know, this is really nothing new, but if your child is not feeling well, they should stay home. They shouldn't be coming in the building. Uh, you know, I want you to consider the reverse. If you've got uh, a healthy child that you're sending to school, they're masked, social distance. What you wouldn't want are your neighbors sending unhealthy kids into the environment with your child. So we all have to be conscious of that. And our, our staff is going to be doing the same thing. To assist with that, we've got a two-step process for screening people. First is a, a, a web-based health screener. And it's very simple. It just asks a series of simple questions such as, do you have a temperature that's 100 degrees Fahrenheit or more? Have you been exposed to anyone who has COVID-19? Questions like that, it's very simple. So you're going to answer that screener online. We will automatically get the answers. So we'll have a spreadsheet ready that'll feed right into a, a laptop that we're gonna have at our door that will tell us if someone failed the check. Very simple, if, if any of the answers to that check are yes, uh, yes, my temperature was higher than 100. Or yes, I've been exposed to someone with COVID. You don't come to school. So it's very simple. Any yes answer to that, you don't come in. If someone does answer yes and does come in or does approach the door, we will have that the, the answer failed on our laptop. Step two, if you answered no to everything, then if you look in the upper right of this screen, you see the photograph of the, the temporal scanner. It's very simple. It's just a no touch forehead temperature. It's just a couple of seconds. So if you answered yes to any of those screening questions, we're not taking your temperature. We're just simply saying you can't be in school today. Otherwise, you get your temperature checked and then you get to come in. And then while we're in school, uh, on a, on a daily basis, under normal circumstances, school nurses across the country are busy all the time with every other medical need children have during the school day. Um, Boo-boos, tummy aches, not feeling well, the, the whole gamut. So our nurses are going to have uh, a big responsibility here. Our students and our staff will be trained on recognition of symptoms. Now, our students and staff are not doctors, so it, you know, this is going to be a, a work in progress as we try to identify other people in the room who may look flushed or uh, be watering at the eyes, which could also be signs of allergy. So 
if someone gets sent to the nurse, the nurse is going to do an assessment to see if they could possibly have symptoms. Uh, how, does, how does your child get to the nurse? Same way as always. Either the, the teacher may see that they're not doing well and may send them to the nurse, or they may raise their hand and say, I have to go to the nurse. So our, our nurse's office is going to be accessible. So worst case scenario, if a nurse does assess a student and feel like they could have COVID-19, then they get isolated. So each of our schools has an isolation area. So if the nurse feels like someone does have, uh, potentially could have COVID-19, then they go sit in the isolation area, the home is contacted, and the child get, gets picked up. The Department of Health is gonna play a big role in this because our nurses go, are gonna have them on speed dial and the Department of Health is going to help us determine what has to happen next. Uh, do they require a, 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 a test, for example? Do they have to go see a physician? So people uh, who have been diagnosed with, without COVID-19 uh, can come back as long as they have uh, a doctor's note, no fever. Uh, if you've been uh, tested, you certainly need a note and proof of the test. If you test positive, well, then you have to stay home for 10 days. If you're potential, then it's 14 days because we don't know if you have it yet and the incubation period is a little bit longer. So all that's going to be done in partnership with the Department of Health. All testing is gonna be done outside of school. We've gotten questions about, uh, you know, can the school do COVID-19 testing? You know, we're going to be busy uh, screening the children, screening the staff as they come in and, do, and doing the actual education aspect of our jobs. Uh, we do not have the capacity to be doing COVID testing. Uh, we, we, we have a, uh, a whole set of referrals. So if you were advised that you need to get a COVID test, and did not know where to, to get it done, we have resources. Then the contact tracing begins. Contact tracing refers to the process wherein if someone is identified to have had COVID-19 or potentially have COVID-19, the Department of Health is going to want to know who they've been in contact with. So we work together with them on giving them the right information so that they know what to tell us with regards to who has to quarantine. So a question we've been asked is about if a child tests positive, does the classroom have to quarantine? Um, so we've been in contact with the Department of Health with regards to you know, what is the specific answer to that? Um, and Answers are vague, but very well could be. So we may very well be saying that classroom and the teacher now has to quarantine for 14 days. And then we have to start contact tracing to find out if there have been any other contacts that merit quarantining. So again, the child will be able to get into the nurse very easily. The nurse will do an assessment and then work with the Department of Health. And as I said up top, Safety is the number one thing because none of this is going to work unless our students and staff are healthy. So number one is making sure that uh, if we need to quarantine people, that will happen and that everyone is safe. Can I answer a question here, Dr. Latinsky? Yeah, okay. please, Let's go for it. So there was a question regarding supervision in the isolation room, and I just want to clarify that a student would never wait alone in an isolation room, you know, anywhere really in, in our school buildings. So. If a child is waiting for their grown up to come pick them up, the nurse, um, if if there's no other children that she needs to to care for, she will be supervising the isolation room. If um, it's a busy time, then we will be having a staff member supervise the students while they're waiting for their grown up. Thank you. Okay. So, Thank you. of course, uh, the safety of Everyone is uh, paramount, and Dr. Latinsky uh, addressed some of our um, points about screening. Uh, but we wanted to let you know uh, the safety standards that are being implemented at the elementary schools. 
They're pretty much the same that are being implemented at the middle high school. Face coverings and masks are required. We did receive a question about the types of face coverings just a few minutes ago. And if a student is to come in with a face mask that's questionable, uh, we do have face masks in the building if we were to have to replace them and give a student another mask. Uh, desks and face shields are purchased and in classrooms right now. We've got some really nice uh, face sh uh, shields and desk um, po polycarbonate desk um, dividers for, for teachers, um, as well as a trifold um, screens for if a teacher does decide to work one-on-one -on -one, uh, with a student, uh, maybe doing a reading assessment or checking in on a math question, uh, that's there for them. All of our classrooms have been repurposed for social distancing of six feet. And signage, as you can see in the photos, has been purchased and we've been placing them uh, across the buildings to assist both with mask wearing, enforcing mask wearing, uh, for hand washing and hand sanitizing, and for social distancing when waiting on a line or waiting at the nurse's office or waiting in the restrooms. And Mr. Scarantino, thank you. I'd just like to add about the, the face covering. So the uh, our guidance indicates all students should be wearing cloth face coverings. Um, and there are many different types out there. Um, obviously, the, the, the thicker, the better. But one thing I can say is uh, no one should be wearing a mask that has valves on it, you know, valves that allow the, the easier airflow in and out of the mask. We do not want. So it should be a cloth face covering, but it should not have valves on it. I'm just going to also interject um, here with some questions. Um, going back to the nurses in our buildings, in our elementary schools, we are each have our own um, dedicated nurse in our building. So we, we do not share nurses. The district has allocated um, to make sure that each building has one. So um, there is one in the building, you know, when they take their lunch, we have staff and also the nurses in the other buildings know when their lunch times are. And we work as a team for that time that they step out, but we have a full-time nurse um, in each of our elementary buildings. Indoor spaces, um, you know, our classrooms, like I mentioned, are all repurposed for social distancing. As you can see in the photo, um, the Daniel Warren photo above, of the Effie Bellow uh, desks and classrooms look very similar. There's signage in the hallways to notify students and staff in the directions of the stairwells. And in the hallways at Bellows, uh, we have two-way traffic. So if you look at the picture in the bottom right, uh, we have the hallways divided so that students know which way uh, to go up and down in the hallways uh, with signage and arrows. Um, there were definitely questions about the cafeterias or cafetoriums and um, the use of the lunchrooms, and we're going to get to that during the lunch and recess portion of our of our presentation. Bathrooms also are being established with social distancing rules in mind. The uh, standard rule will be uh, two students in a restroom and no more than two students waiting out to use a restroom. Um, and that will also have uh, office staff helping us monitor that during particular times of the day. Um, transition areas, stairwells, halls, doors, uh, we will definitely be enforcing social distancing uh, during those times as kids move from uh, one place to another. There's a few questions here. Go ahead. Uh, so if we could go back to the previous slide. There's a question regarding, I'm going to start with, um, are desks being shared between cohorts? So the answer at Daniel Warren is yes. The picture that you see there, um, which is an early setup before the teachers come in and put her touch on it or his touch on it. But um, when a student is in the school building, they have the same desk all day. However, at the end of the day, part of our cleaning protocols with our custodial teams and the electrostatic machines that we mentioned will be cleaning all of, of the desks, preparing them for the next day. 
Um, but yes, they are being shared between two students and assigned um, on the alternating days. At, at, at Effie Bellows, in the rooms that we can allow it, we do have the double desk one next to the other. There are some rooms at Effie Bellows where we can, we have to have students share a desk. And so in those cases, we're going to ensure, right? And we're going to talk, we talked about that earlier about uh, cleaning protocols. Those desks are going to be cleaned every, every evening uh, with the static sprayers. They'll be in the rooms. And so those clean, those desks will be disinfected for use the following day. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So outdoor spaces, both at Daniel Warren and at Effie Bellows, we have some very nice large playground areas and field spaces for students to go outside and maximize the outdoor learning capacity when the weather permits. Um, Tara and I are talking about how we're going to schedule that and how teachers will be selecting time to use some of these spaces uh, to ensure that social distancing is still being adhered to even when in the outdoor spaces. But we've got uh, the beautiful Peace Garden. The FEB Life Garden was um, repurposed a little bit over the summer so that we could allow for uh, students to be able to go out there for some more um, outdoor lessons. The fields, obviously you've seen our fields, they're huge um, and there's a lot of space, especially for physical education classes which we are definitely um, going to take advantage of. Patio spaces are blacktop play areas. Um, and we're ensuring that whatever areas are used that we're looking at, and Tara added the wonderful photo of our six feet distancing sign, that we're ensuring that that takes place during that time. Um, and you may have heard at the last board meeting and also during the high school, middle school presentation, information about tents. And so we shared that New York State uh, has a few restrictions uh, regarding the tents that makes them not feasible for us to use. And I'll just repeat uh, one of them, the, uh, the cost of a tent, as Dr. Latinsky said in his presentation, is around $20,000 for the use of 12 students. Um, and inclement weather, will end up making that space useless at a certain point in time. Uh, so we looked at the cost uh, and the specifications for design, and it just was not feasible for us at this time. Some questions around layout of the classrooms, and if we could elaborate more on that. Um, so the, the picture that we shared, you know, just shows one classroom, but you can envision that each room, the um, where you see the desks there, they're, they're well spaced apart. We're gonna be finally marking them so that we have their location so that when they do move a little bit, we know where to place them back. Each classroom um, is, is similar to this. There's a few other things that would go into this classroom. It's just starting to get set up. The kindergarten wing um, is, is set up similarly. We've had, we've had to take tables out of classrooms and put desks in so we have individual spots. Um, the kindergarten team that's been in so far, they're continuing to con think about the ways to make that room warm and inviting and developmentally appropriate, but there are desks in there. Um, so there, there really aren't tables anymore in our classrooms, at least for, for this time. We, um, the question around isolating them to a wing. So your child remains, you know, in their classroom for most of their day, the teachers teach the majority of the subjects. We, um, wouldn't be isolating in the sense that a kindergartner may go into our library media room, but you know, the 10, the nine to 10 students in that day would go to our library media center where we, we also have arranged the room to support distancing and um, Ms. Kowalczyk will be thinking about which activities make sense in there for those times. Same thing for when the students go to music. We know music needs a larger space, so they may be going outside for music or into our auditorium for music. So there's times when they will travel. We've looked at our routes. We've looked at our hallway directions, our stairwell directions, as we previously shared. So there will be times they leave that space in their cohort. We did receive a question about temporary tents. And so temporary tents do not meet 
as I stated, the New York State restrictions are pretty um, stringent. And so you can't have a temporary tent. It has to meet fire code. So we did explore all options around tents. All right, so regarding uh, facilities and cleaning, uh, these photographs are actually from our uh, our middle school, high school building, but but they apply. On the right, you see the um, water fountain. So we don't want kids bending over, putting their lips close to a spout that, that everyone's sharing. So the only thing that will be operating on the water fountains is the bottle filler. And we will have cups available if students don't have a bottle will be a, a cup dispenser so they can use it in that manner without having to, to put their mouth on a, on a shared spigot. The other photograph you see there is of a toilet with a, a new seat cover put in. You know, typically, uh, and in most, uh, you know, large municipal facilities, uh, you're not going to find toilet seats. You're going to find things that are extremely easy to clean. So we do need things that are easy to clean, but we also wanted the toilet seat cover so when you flush the toilet and you get that uh, invisible plume of uh, vapor that comes out, by closing the toilet seat, that vapor doesn't escape. So we're, we're trying to really address a lot of different details uh, and add little features to our buildings to make them as safe as possible. Uh, but one of the things we've been talking about a lot is, is ventilation. Uh, our elementary buildings really do not have air conditioning in anything other than large spaces. So for classrooms, it's opening the windows. Uh, and there are, you know, if you just remember your, your science lessons about hot air rising, uh, you, can, you can get a lot out of the, the windows top and bottom by opening up the top and the bottom windows to help the circulation of airflow in the classroom. In those few spaces at the elementary schools where we do have air conditioning, they are using the, the, the highest rating of, of MERV filter, which is just a system of, of looking at the efficiency of what the, the filter uh, filters out. We're using the highest rating of filters, and we've actually increased our filters from uh, a level eight to the maximum a level 11 that our system can handle. The other thing we've done is uh, double the the cycle of filter replacement. So we're filtering, we're replacing those filters twice as often. And then normally, what happens in a school building after the staff and students leave, the building kind of shuts down. The custodians clean up, and when then they finish, you go into a nighttime mode. Our air filtration system in those spaces will be on a 24-hour daytime cycle to get the the maximum amount of air circulation as possible. And then lastly on this slide, electrostatic sprayers, which we're using the same uh, distance, disinfectants we would by hand. The only thing the electrostatic sprayers do is it speeds the process and it covers a wider area. So if you imagine a custodian going around with a, a, a spray bottle and a, a towel or, or a wipe, they're going to be doing the same thing, only in a much more efficient manner. So the electrostatic sprayers are going to increase the effectiveness and reduce the time, or in our case, um, allow for increased uh, and more rapid cleaning. So there have been many questions about lunch and recess at the elementary schools, and so we're going to spend some time here first giving you a rundown of the general specific information, uh, general information, and then get a little specific about our plans at each building. So lunch will be a grab and go with touchless payment at both, at both schools. So at Bellows, uh, students will not be touching the keypad and entering their number. If they are purchasing the lunch, they'll go to the front, they'll say their name, someone on the staff will punch their number in, and they'll uh, go sit down and eat lunch. Um, also added uh, for the home learning day, uh, we're gonna be able to have you pre-order the lunch for your child's at home learning day and uh, so that you can pick it up 
and have it available, put it right in the fridge uh, for the day that they're home. So that's gonna be an option for you as well. And we'll uh, talk a little bit more about what that'll look like building to building as, as we open. Um, assigned seats and tables are taking place in the cafeterias. As you can see, there's a photo there of the Effie Bellows cafeteria. And we have uh, six feet of distance between each child. You'll see there's a sign that says, you may please sit here uh, with a black taped line to let them know that that's their lunch area space. No one will be sitting in front of them on the other side, so they won't be face to face. And what we're what we're looking to do um, at lunch and recess at the grade level lunches is uh, we're following what we're calling a play eat eat play model, and I'll explain it as we get uh, as right toward the end. Um, custodian cleaning is going to happen in between every time a group eats and transitions. Our custodians are going to be right there to clean and disinfect those that space for the next group coming in. Masks will be required uh, during a recess. Uh, we will be designating places uh, on the blacktop or across the fields uh, as break zones. Uh, we're working on that so that kids know while they're running around or they're playing that if they needed a mask break, they can go to that zone, take the mask off for a little bit, put that mask back on, and then engage in the organized game that they might be involved in. The RYY continues to uh, partner with us during our lunch and recess programs. And after talking to them, they have plenty of great social distancing fun games in mind that they're going to um, implement during lunch and recess for our students, as well as help support our monitors in performing those duties as well so that we have enough uh, games and interest going on uh, during that time. Uh, when students are done and coming back inside, uh, there will be hand sanitizing stations set up so that when they re-enter the buildings, they can sanitize their hands really quickly and then teachers will have them wash their hands again more than likely when they re-enter the classroom. And uh, we're going to implement lineup spots. Uh, Ms. Goldberg added a really cute uh, panther paw print there to let you see what it may look like. We're gonna have paw prints with six feet of distance in the number of class row lines in front of the door that children will be re-entering um, at the end of the lunch recess period um, to help keep it organized and help kids to understand uh, their responsibility and role in uh, a safe and easy transition. So like I said, we're gonna get a little bit into our, our plans a little bit deeper. Um, and so at Bellows, we have three designated lunch periods, one for third, one for fourth, and one for fifth grade. So what will happen is if third grade has a cohort, let's say cohort one is about 52 children, that cohort will come to lunch and recess, but only 25 students will be eating lunch in the cafeteria. We'll be doing it based on homeroom class, and that will go out to families once it's finalized and to teachers. So 25 students or half the cohort will eat lunch while the other half of the cohort will be out at lunch and recess. At the halfway mark, we'll signal for a transition to line up to come back inside and for students to go outside for their recess period. Custodians will clean in between Fourth and fifth grade lunch will follow that same model. So just to paint a picture at Daniel Warren, um, we, when your child is going into the lunchroom, they'll enter the space. The tables look similar to the picture here where they're in a long row, one student per table. So they have their six feet. We actually put a little seat spot too. We have like a row where there is a dinosaur picture, another row is the elephant, so the kids can get familiar with where their spot is, and it's, um, again, going to be assigned to them, so it's the same individual sitting there. They'll have lunch. Now, the students that are having recess outside, when they hear the bell, as they typically would, that recess is over, they'll come line up on their assigned row outside on their panther paw. And the reason why we want to do this very um, in a very organized way is that we're going to be using a lot of communication this year. So we will have the staff that are working in the lunchroom with their walkie talkie. So as soon as the students who are leaving that space 
start to make the route that they take to go outside, the custodians are going to be cleaning. We do not want the students who are at recess coming in to have any of that back up in the stairwell or to come in as they historically did in one big group and just go right into the lunchroom. We want them to hold in place until we know that we've been able to do our, sana our sanitizing procedures. So as soon as, it, as it's clean, I'll be able to radio down to say, please you know, send up line one and they'll be able to come up um, the stairwell with distancing into their, with their masks on to their to their lunch spot. So we're gonna be communicating a lot to make sure that this is done um, you know, really systematically. Uh, and that, that, that'll be the case as they flip for our lunch and recess. And as many of you heard previously, the kindergarten, um, you know, needing to space all of this out and wanting to make sure kids were eating at a time that made, you know, the most sense. Our kindergartners, because we have the monitors there, will be staying with their group to have their lunch in their classroom um, and their recesses outdoors. So we were able to separate that. So again, in a space that typically holds 350, which you know, on a typical year would be 170 ish. We're down to 50, you know, 50 or so kids eating in that that room, well spaced out um, in, in a very systematic way. I'm trying to think if there are any other questions. Are you monitoring any? Do we have any about lunch and recess? I think this answered them all. For the grab and go, we, we may change our procedures from the tickets and we want to make sure lunch is accessible even on the home days. So there will be a way for you to order lunch so that at the end of the in-person day, we're able to have that child, you know, go into the cooler or we can hand from the cooler their lunch to go home with them for their home day. But we're going to make sure it's, it's you know, touchless in terms of payment and that everything is, is organized and delivered so that it's, it's smooth for those that require school lunch. We do have a few, we do have a few questions about um, if there's a possibility to change the cafeteria plan to um, classrooms. And um, that wouldn't kids be uncomfortable facing forward and alone at the lunch at the lunch tables? And I would tell you that there there you'll find that with six feet of distance, even in that photo there, they'll find a way to communicate with one another uh, during lunch and, and recess. I don't think just because they're facing forward, they're not going to interact and socialize. Um, but we also wanted to just, I guess, address some of the classroom, uh, why classrooms, they were considered, but we did look at the New York State and CDC guidance around uh, those spaces uh, and regarding communal spaces. And they do mention not using them if possible. They don't say it's the best way to keep people safe. They say if possible. And if you are going to use those lunchrooms and cafeterias, you just need to ensure you're cleaning them and sanitizing them after every use. And so that's in our plan. So we looked at that guidance carefully because as we've said, and we've seen them in the questions about normalcy, uh, you know, we do want our kids to not be stuck in the same room all day long either, right? Kids uh, need to get out. And there is lots of research about the idea that you need to move them out of that one space to let some of that fresh air circulate in the room. They say if they're sitting in the room sometimes for too long a period of time without them exiting the rooms, if we have those windows open as we've stated we're doing, that that fresh air isn't circulating at that same, at that same rate. Um, and so we spent a lot of time reading uh, about uh, all of the different things to ensure that our plan is it addressing those concerns as well? Yeah, and I just want to, to, to add, there are, uh, um, when, when we think about kids moving into school, around school, uh, our frame of reference is a normal situation, but we're only going to have half the kids in the building. So there will be half the kids in the hall, half the kids in the classroom, half the kids everywhere. There are those days during the school year, the, the day before Thanksgiving, the day before a two week winter break, when you know people leave early on vacations, you can feel that there are fewer kids in the building. It's, it's, it's readily apparent. So this is gonna be a, a dramatic example of that. So um, I know a lot of times mentally we're thinking about our image of kids in the building, but as you can see from the, the photograph there, uh, they're, they're gonna be spread out. There, there will simply be fewer bodies to get in the way of each other. And that is a small silver lining 
in uh, in getting this done. I want to answer a rainy day recess, um, sort of paint the picture for that. I know that comes up a lot. So inclement weather, because sometimes it might be, you know, snow or for whatever reason, we're not able to go outside. So um, I've always loved the procedures um, at Daniel Warren for rainy day recess. So we've had to, to adjust them. Um, but essentially what happens is each of our classes are assigned a location. So we need six locations. Um, historically, we would have sent two classes together, um, but now we'll have, you know, nine or, nine or 10 students, their, their cohort going together. So if it's a rainy day, we usually make the announcement and we have a schedule. So we'll say it's a rainy day, day one, and teachers look at the schedule and then they know where they're bringing their students if they have recess first. So, you know, that may be the gym, it may be our wonder studio, uh, maybe our art room. And when they get to those places, again, distance, you know, there's 50% of the students, we needed to revise what's taking place in those locations. So um, we are putting together some, some fun, like in your spot types of activities, like a charades type of a thing that will be led by the, um, the teacher or the teaching assistant who's with that group of students. So they're there for their 25 or so minutes for their recess. Um, so that's organized, it rotates, it cycles, um, you know, you don't have too many days in a row. So we actually don't, it takes us a while to get through this, but we, um, we, we prefer that over, you know, the students, let's say watching a movie in the same spot, you know, we want to give them time to, to draw. We're going to be revising our rainy day bins. We always have, um, a great parent volunteer who will reach out and maybe collect games for us. So we won't be using games this year, but we're thinking about like what individual little baggies can we hand kids so that they can take out the drawing materials and use that. And it's one-to-one. -one. Um, so on a rainy day, students go to these locations rather than outside. And then they go to their typical lunch, their lunch plan. Um, going back to the classrooms too, we also allow, that gives us time for cleaning in between the classrooms as well. When, when we exit, we could do a another clean before we come in for the afternoon. Our classrooms at Daniel Warren all have sinks. Um, so we're able to wash our hands. We also have the, the sanitizer stations. And there was a question about um, touchless. Our main bathrooms, um, the students, you know, can the water automatically dispenses so they don't need to use the handle. And we do in our videos and when we teach kids best practices for health and hygiene, we do show them how to take the, the paper towel and, and use the handles and, and whatnot. But many of our um, bathrooms, it is touchless and they just, you know, put their hands underneath. Thank you. Tara, we received a question about picnic style um, eating outside. Um, and so at Bellows with the play, eat, eat, play model, it's not something that I wouldn't tell you we couldn't look at. We'd have to see based on all of the recess games and activities that we're planning, if it's feasible for us to allow the picnic style lunch. We did purchase, and uh, actually the PDSA was generous enough to purchase some uh, bench style tables for us. But what we realized was after getting them, we needed more than the number, than four tables to really allow for a lot of outdoor um, dining for kids. Um, we've, we've got about six tables here. Um, so we're looking at at least at Bellows, I have that little patio area. Um, establishing maybe a space for some kids to rotate in and out and eat, but it's hard uh, when you think about equity as well. So at this time, uh, we're not looking at picnic style lunch um, at Bellows, but I couldn't tell you that we couldn't consider looking at it uh, at, as a startup at the beginning of the year. But at this time, it's just something we, I guess we can explore. Yeah, I see those questions as well. So it would be something we'd have to look into the supervision, the assignments, and, and just making sure we can facilitate that safely with space and and supervision. But, you know, we certainly can look at that. And I'm, I'm seeing questions, too, about bringing students home for lunch. And I want to explore that and just work, you know, work through that scenario. I know historically we've allowed a parent to come pick up their child and, and return them. But I have to now consider um you know, if that's a large number, are we looking at the arrival, the health screening and, and those pieces of it? So I would just need a little bit more time to explore that. Agreed. Yep.
So by now you should have received an email from our district on Monday about our new one-to-one -one Chromebook initiative for students in grades three through 12. And we're really excited about this program. It's actually um, a direction we've been moving for a couple of years, and this just gave us a wonderful opportunity to take advantage of it. So what this means is that your student, if you are have a student in Bellows, um, and then this was part of the middle school and high school conversation as well, will receive a Rynec Chromebook to use in the building as well as at home on their home learning days. They can use it on the weekends and it is theirs to use over the summer as well. So it will be um, designated to your child a specific device. We've received some emails, um, parents asking about bringing in their own devices to school. Because of guidelines on shared devices and because computers are such a high touch object, we ask that in the building, your child uses their Rynec issued device. At home, they're welcome to use whatever device you have at home, but we ask that in, in Bellows, they use their Rynec issued device. Daniel Warren is a little bit different. We are offering devices for students on their home learning days to take home with them. They will be given them in September. They do not need to bring them back into the building with them. Those should just stay at home. There will be devices in Daniel Warren for students to use that will be cleaned um, as students use them and specific to those students on the days they're in the building. So if you request a device um, and your child is in Daniel Warren, that device will just stay home and your child can use it on their home learning days. He or she does not need to bring it back with them on their days in the classroom. If your child's at, at Bellows, then your child will bring the device back and forth with them. So um, Bellows students will receive their devices on their opening days. And in the email sent home on Monday was a technology agreement that outlines our one-to-one -one handbook that has a lot of the procedures and the expectations and responsibilities on all of our parts, um, as well as some tips for cleaning it and for carrying it and what is and is not allowed. So I encourage you to read through that with your child. If you would like a copy to print, it's also posted on our district website, the technology page in a PDF format. Many parents requested that, so we've posted it um, in the flip model and then as well in a PDF. So please have that submitted to us by the 25th, uh, which is next Tuesday. Daniel Warren students, the, or, there's a form as well for the request. And in that it just talks, there's the Rynec agreement about borrowing a technology device from us. So please go over that with your child, as well as both groups should read our acceptable use policy and our code of conduct. Um, and those should also be in as by the 25th as well to help us kind of plan for distribution. If your child is choosing the remote, all remote option, yes, they can still partake in, they will still get a district device. We will be in touch about the pickup windows because the students will get the devices in school. And for Daniel Warren families, we'll be in touch about the pickup windows. And then if you've chosen the remote option for your child, we will be in touch about those pickup windows. Um, in addition to that, we have a variety of district approved technologies that we have purchased and we're working with the staff on for students. It allows for us to, you know, broad kind of web based instructional programs that allow for our teachers to engage our students in the classroom as well as at home. They're ones that we'll build on um, throughout the year and they're all meant to enhance and supplement the curriculum that the students will receive from their teachers in the classroom and on their home learning days. We understand Google Classroom is the platform that we use consistently across the district for student work and communication with our students. We are extending that this year down to Daniel Warren. So uh, in a, uh, within the coming weeks, a variety of instructional videos will be posted on our technology page as well as our parent page. And I think we also said our reopening area so that you can, re you can view those videos with your children and for yourself on how to navigate Google Classroom and Google Drive. Um, there'll be just short videos, specific topics that help you navigate that situation if your child's home and you're unsure of how to turn up an assignment in or how to access something. So those videos will help you with that. Um, and then the other programs that your, your child's teachers will be in touch about with how to use those and we'll post videos on those as, as we have them as well to help you navigate those technologies at home. And then as always, we're here to answer any questions you, you might have. Please feel free to reach, reach out to us. Thank you, Mary. I want to answer some questions um, going back to lunch. First, um, there was one around snack and your child's teacher will communicate the 
the snack um, procedures for that room. They all typically have a time where, where they allow snack and they'll continue to do that for the in-person days. Um, I know some of the teachers here when we were speaking were looking at it as maybe a time when they would go outside to have a, like a mass break and have snacks. So um, you can, you know, look out, you know, for that information that'll come directly from your child's teacher. Um, you know, as we said at the beginning, there's a lot of information going out today where we're trying to help you understand the reopening plans, but we will be communicating, you know, as we get closer to the first day of school, going back to what our arrival and dismissal, what, you know, your your child will need that your teacher will communicate. Um, for example, their water bottle, um, a tower, a towel for when we want to go outside. So little things like that will be communicated, but snack will be one of them. And regarding lunches going home on the home learning day being labeled, um, we will be distributing those those bag lunches at the end of the day. So it's not like they're getting two during the lunch time. They'll um, receive the ones for the next day at dismissal time. We'll come up with a, a system for that. We have cooler bags and um, I, I have to look at how many we're talking, but they certainly we certainly can put a name on those brown bags and, and have a label for, for that should they not be going directly home. Um, but it's not like they're going to hold on to them for the day. They're going to go right from a cooler into their, their backpack at dismissal time. So now I'm going to go on to the next slide, unless you have anything to add, Mr. Scarantino. From the uh, yeah, I mean, we staggered the arrival and dismissal times at Bellows. As you can see, there's... Let, let's start with that. I haven't gone that way. I'm talking about lunch. I need for the question. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> you, might need a, you might need a snack, Ms. Goldberg. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, we, we okay. Go uh, ahead. So we staggered the arrival times at Bellows. As you can see, there 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 are ten minute interval staggered times for drop off. We will not be hosting the early morning library program, and you'll hear more about the suspension of our early programs. So we're asking parents to adhere to these times. We do know that when there's a sibling being dropped off in a lower grade, uh, and sorry, that 825 is the third grade. Uh, so it's third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. Um, when you're dropping off a sibling, let's say you have a third grade sibling, he's coming in at 825, but he's got a brother or sister in the fourth or fifth grade, you may drop off that sibling at that 825 time. Um, this will help just so that you're not coming back a second time. Um, we'll be doing the same thing for dismissal times. So as you can see, fifth grade will dismiss first, and they'll come out. If they have a sibling in one of the lower grades, we'll ensure that the teacher of the other lower grade student knows that they can release that student during the same time so that families are united or reunited at the same time, and you can easily leave uh, the bellows grounds and that will move our dismissal line uh, quickly. So at Daniel Warren, I'm gonna walk you through arrival and dismissal. And as I shared, we're gonna certainly send this in information to you so that you will have um, time to unpack it all and know what to expect. So our arrival times remain 8.25 to 8.50. So 8.25 is when our doors open and we start the process. Um, and again, just keeping in mind, it's it's 50%. So we certainly know what that feels like, as Dr. Latinsky shared on an early dismissal day or when we've had um, holidays, we feel the difference. So we we imagine this working well, but there's also increased procedure. So we you know appreciate everyone's patience as we as we give it a go. Um, so when arrival opens, the 8:25 time, we have that window of time for students to enter the building. I want to stress that it is just the children entering the building. I know that's hard, um, especially those, the, the younger students on those first days. Um, so we'll, we'll walk you through the, the first day of school. I know it's one of the questions on, on September 8th and 9th for orientations. But during a typical arrival, when um, we have our walkers and we have our car line. So at Daniel Warren, when the car line's pulling through, there will be a system. We have reallocated um, all of our staff for the morning procedures. When students enter the building, they're going to be going directly to their classroom ra rather than um, a group area as we historically did. Teachers will be receiving them. It'll stagger the unpacking and settling in and, and starting um, to do some, some work right when they enter the school building. So May I interject for one second? Sure. Yeah, same at, at Bellows. They will be entering in a classroom. We will not be gathering 
outside like we typically do in the playground area. Students will be coming directly into the school building during the arrival times. Thank you, Ms. Goldberg. So with that said, we've, we've organized staff to do different, um, different levels of support, whether it's supervision or actually being a little bit more part of the, the health screening. So if you were a, a family that drives, you will be pulling into our driveway. And um, as you're pulling down, there will be a staff member who um, will be coming to the car. We're asking that children don't get out as they historically would, where they hop out and then go up the sidewalk into the the school, we're asking them to remain in their car until the staff member comes. We um, want to make sure that we're able to do our health screening. So we know for the youngest students, that's that's the parents helping to communicate that with us. So you'll be showing, you know, your your that you passed. It's green. It'll come up on your your phone or your smart device. In addition, we can look it up if you don't have it. We'll take the temporal scan as that student's hopping out of the car and then they're sort of gonna get a fast pass because they got out of the car, you don't have to stop, you don't have to get out of your car. That child's gonna be able to come right into the school building um, from, from that experience and staff will be masked and they'll have their, their visors on. Um, and we're just asking that you're able to say, we participated, we can check that, we can scan them. And then they got that fast pass sort of right into the school building with staff to assist. For those walkers, there will be, um, the, the sidewalk, the patios, the two main doors, there will be staff there who will be able to see that they've passed that sort of level one clearance where you answered the questions that they're healthy to come in. And then there will be a station for the temporal scans um, for the students to then, you know, have them go into the building. So more of those details will be shared with you, but arrival will be similar, but then we'll be taking the students and they'll be going right to their classrooms. We have staff assigned all over the building the stairwells, the hallways, making sure that kids get right to um, where they need to be. We even have kindergarten runners for the little people to make sure that they're getting right to their door and we can you know, be accountable for, for everyone that we have inside our building. For dismissal, dismissal will be similar to a rainy day dismissal if you've experienced that here with the exception of the parents coming in for the kindergarten. So for dismissal, um, we're asking, we have two dismissal times as we historically have, the 2.45 and the three o'clock. And like Mr. Scarantino said, if you had a, have a sibling and you're coming to pick up a kindergartner, we'll make sure that they're ready to come out together. We will have people stationed um, in the driveway more than historically with walkie talkies. So as you're pulling up and you have that car pass, if you're a driver, we'll be able to radio. Um, that you are here and the child is actually coming directly from the classroom. Um, we're, we're keeping them in their space, packed up and ready. And the teachers are going to be standing outside their door. And we have folks assigned with the walkie talkies hearing who's there so we can send those students out. Um, so they'll come directly to the cars based on your arrival time. For our walkers, this will be um, new. We will have some pickup posts. There will be signage and a, a, um, a little divider there. You, you'll have some distant spots waiting your turn and you will go up. We're hoping to continue even using the signs there. You certainly can say your name, but it'll be easy if we can quickly read um, who's approaching for pickup. We will be walkie talking. That child will come out, come down. And then we're asking that you could then clear a side um, to move the arrival. So this is new. We certainly know it's going to take more time, um, but we're hoping having 50% and what we've done historically on a rainy day is, you know, allows us to do this and we'll be reflecting on it. You know, after day one, what worked, what didn't work after the first week, you know, what are we hearing? How's it going? So it's certainly something that we'll adjust if we need to, but we're, we're trying to eliminate the congestion and we're asking folks obviously to be wearing their masks and to be distancing um, as much as possible during the time outside of our, our grounds as well. Um, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything for questions. No, uh, I have a clarifying on the arrival time. Uh, do I guess because we have fifth grade. we have to fix that, but and we'll share it. It's uh, fifth grade arrival time eight twenty five, fifth grade dismissal time three o five third grade arrival time, 8.45, with third grade dismissal times at 3.15. And we'll make sure you get that and see it correctly on the chart. Yeah, and you'll be getting more information about the, the screening process. Like here's mine from today. This allowed nice. me to 
come into the building. Ms. Goldberg I, has access. I, I filled it out and it, it, it showed me the screen right away. So we'll be sending the directions, um, the QR labels outside. If you forget, you could quickly hold your phone up and do it. Um, it's already on our website. It's it's going to be on our, our district pages and you'll be receiving a um, text every morning to remind you to complete it. So we mm -hmm. certainly recognize it's, it's another thing that you need to do, but we know it's important as well that, that we're trying to streamline the, the process to make sure we have everybody um, cleared to come into the building. Yeah, and you can find those arrival dismissal times for Bellows in your placement letter. They were in the placement letter. I'm sure everyone was more interested in cohorts. Uh, so just so you know that, that the correct times are there as well. Move on to the next slide. So I'm going to do a series of slides around the schedule and around our models. So first, I wanted to start by just making sure we all have a common language for synchronous learning and asynchronous learning. So to define synchronous learning, that's when students are learning the material at the same time and, and place with their teacher. So that's our in-person instruction days. So in our hybrid model, when your child is coming into school, that's synchronous learning. It's also synchronous learning if they're home learning remotely with a live instructor. So when that's happening and they're like us right now in this meeting you know, through Google Meets, that's synchronous. For asynchronous learning, that's when students learn the same material but not together in the same place. At, or at the same time. So that might be a pre-recorded lesson that's shared and you have the liberty to watch it um, you know, on your own time. It might be a completion of tasks or you know, assignments that are given to you. Um, again, the child doing their own pacing, working through the schedule. So we're gonna refer to synchronous learning and asynchronous learning in each of our models. Next slide, please. So before I go into those models, I just want to um, help you understand that in a typical year, when a child in elementary school is in their classroom, they're receiving a mix of, of pedagogy, of, of, of instruction. So there may be direct instruction where the teacher is you know, starting the lesson, introducing the teaching point, why it's important, modeling in front of them. There's time when there's independent work where they're going off and they're practicing that either within their, their math pages or they're doing in their own independent reading or their own writing. So there's independent work, there's group, there's time when we want students to come together in partnerships or in small group. So throughout the day, there's that movement. There, there's never a time, certainly not in, in K-1-2 where we're really asking students to attend to direct instruction for more than what's developmentally appropriate. We're, we're aiming those mini lessons at the start of, let's say, reading to be, you know, 10, 15 minutes, 20, no more. And then they, they try it and then they maybe come back. So throughout the day, the students are listening to their teacher, perhaps to their peers or, or doing their own, their own thinking work. In addition to that, in a typical year, students receive instruction from our specialists, um, those teachers for art, music, library, media center, one time per six day cycle in most cases, and but in phys ed, two times per six day cycle. So as we go into the plans and in our hybrid plan, I'm gonna speak to first, we wanted to make that best use of that in-person time. So when your child's receiving the synchronous instruction in person on their days, the teacher's gonna shift some of the direct instruction to make sure that they're covering the big ideas, the things they know what they want their students in front of them for on the days when the students are there so that they can model more explicitly. They're able to have the students engage and practice with them, ask questions. So they're doing a little bit of the shift to make sure that those days are maximized. And then the lessons that would typically be a reminder and then the kids go off and practice and then you might be assessing and seeing how they're doing it. That might be something we could shift to the home learning days so that we can really stay on pace with our curriculum and cover everything that we need to cover within the allotted time. So to do this, as, you know, to do this well, we might even shift the number of practice or reinforcement activities. For example, if there were 
three problems that the students would have done historically, we might zoom in on two. We might do one and then take the pulse and then do another one and then send them to like, this is what you'll be doing on your home learning day. So we're gonna shift a little bit of that to make the most efficient use of time. And then in the hybrid model, we're thinking about our specials. Students um, are going to be able to, on their in-person days, be able to still experience art, music, library, media center, and, and PE. So on the next few slides, if we could go on, because there's a lot of questions, but I feel like I should go through the three slides and then make sure we covered them all, because many of them will come up. I, I am going to spend time sharing with you the hybrid model, which is how we're reopening school at this time the remote model should we need to go full remote and then the optional remote plan those of you that may be experiencing a full instruction at home so i'm going to spend time talking about each starting with the hybrid model so you received you received your cohort assignment letter and you're either in cohort one or cohort two we were thinking about consistency for parents we know none of this is easy but we wanted to make sure there was some predictable structure to it. So Mondays and Wednesdays for cohort one, Tuesdays and Thursdays for cohort two. So Friday day, Fridays are a little tricky. We recognize that they alternate, but we wanted to maximize in-person instruction and we wanted it to be equitable. So if you're looking at the calendar, you'll see um, if it's a short week, how it's given to the, the cohort that missed instruction or it alternates. So if you're looking across a whole semester, you know, tri trimesters in our elementary schools, there's a balance of, of these days. So there's a calendar here um, that you can also access on our websites, on our district pages. And I wanna zoom in on the first two days of school because there's a lot of questions about that. So we historically have offered orientation on our first day of school. So that will be the eighth and the ninth. So cohort two starts because it just happens to be a Tuesday. And on that day for cohort two, it will be a half day. So that's in both of our schools. Our times are a bit different. So you'll get that information, but you know, it's 1115 dismissal at Daniel Warren. It's 1130 dismissal-ish at um, F.E. Bellows. So on those days, um, for the first day, you'll, you'll be doing the arrival procedures. Your child will come in, they'll experience getting to know their teacher and some of the routines, um, and it'll be a half day. The same thing happens the next day on the ninth, only it's for cohort one. The students who are in kindergarten, we've always had an orientation where the student gets to get, you know, a tour of the, of the school and gets to know their classroom a little bit. And we, we, we do that in a smaller group. To maintain that, we've reduced um, the number of children coming in for the orientation. So those families have received that information in their, their placement letter if they're in the morning or in the afternoon. So only five students will be coming in the morning with the grown up. So to keep it at 10. And then again, in the afternoon, we distance these so they're not around dismissal times or arrival times then this, the second group comes in. So those families have those times, they're welcome to call and speak with um, Mrs. Hutchinson, the secretary, if they need any clarification. But we have the orientations preserved on the 8th and the 9th. It's September 10th, where we start to pick up our alternating day schedule with cohort two coming in for a full day. And the same goes for kindergarten. Those students would be coming in for their first full day. And then the schedule follows as you, as you look um, and follow along. I'm going to go on to the next slide, please. So when I transition to, to remote model, I'm only speaking to the plan should school not be open in, in person in the building first. I'm going to go into the optional remote in the next slide. So again, in the hybrid model, your child has been assigned a teacher. They will be attending school for in-person on their e-learning day, the day that they're home. It's called the home learning day. They will be logging into Google Classroom. They will, you know, have everything now warehoused for them in one location. So there won't be those emails as we did in the spring. There won't be those grids or their charts. This is going to be the place where you will go and it will access what's needed for that day. And I need to clarify that there is no 
synchronous learning from your classroom teacher on that day. That was the in-person day. On the home learning day, it's extending what was taught, it's practicing. There may be um, a video perhaps that they need to watch for reading workshop and then they go off and they do their, their independent reading time. There may be an assignment where they log into iReady and the teacher assigned them a practice activity. We've purchased in sync, um, which is a digital version of our math curriculum. There may be a video there showing some instruction and then they go do some practice pages. So that day is asynchronous. And that's because your child's teacher taught in person 50% of the time. We wanna make sure that that's, that's happening for both parties of students. Those are gonna be in the full remote that I explained in a minute, the optional remote will have that as well. So during that time, there's much more continuity than the spring. Your child, you know, will be doing something at home and bringing it back to school the next day. So your, your teacher might say, you know, take out that work from, from home and let's start by reviewing it. So there's gonna be that back and forth. Um, there's going to be the ability for books to be brought home and to have them at home and, and go back and forth for your child. There will also be digital resources as well, like RAS Kids that will bulk up your resources for what you may need at home. So, so we're working with teachers on what those Google Classrooms will look like. In addition, questions about um, continuity and just having it be the same across all of the classrooms. Yes, there's a beauty in you know what a teacher brings to their own classroom, um, but for this purposes, we need to make sure that each classroom is, is assigning the same assignments at the end of the day. And that if your child is in one class, then your neighbor who maybe is in another class will have the same Google Classroom assignments on the home learning day. So that's something that we need to do. Um, we always wanna take the pulse of our students and adjust our teaching. We'll have to do that through differentiation, but those Google Classrooms will be the same across all of our classes on that grade. They will have the same work and the same pacing because we know families have different arrangements for those home learning days. So you can expect that. For the full remote, so should we need to go full remote? We're using the same letter day calendar. We're continuing to use the cohort model. So on the day that your child would have been in person receiving instruction, they'll continue to get the live instruction with their teacher on that day in a synchronous manner, similar to this meeting. They may go into a Google Meet to have that mini lesson for reading, and then they go off to practice and then they come back in live. So it would be staggered across the day. There would be opportunities for their morning meeting. All of that would be built in. I can't provide you with that schedule right now um, because that's the work we're gonna be doing with teachers. That's, you know, that information would come. You would certainly have the schedule for your child and when they would need in advance. Um, and the only time that schedule might change is for assessments. You know, if we need to do a one-to-one -one reading assessment, then we have to send those children an individual invite for the time that the teacher would be conferring to do that assessment. So those would be the things that would change in, in this type of model. But we also um, wanna make sure there's that consistency. And it allows our, our class sizes and group sizes to be smaller, which we know for live instruction has proven to be more effective during the synchronous learning time so that the engagement is there. The only thing that may change, um, you know, at, at, at least at the Daniel Warren level and perhaps at the Effie Bellows is specials. Um, we want to continue to make sure that the specials are happening. So, you know, it may be that your in-person live instruction coming from the specialty teacher might be on the other day, just because we need to make sure those teachers um, can teach um, are available for that synchronous time across um, all of our students. So in a full remote model, you would receive more information in advance but essentially it's very similar to, to our hybrid model. But now I'm gonna shift and go on to the next slide and discuss our optional remote plan, which you received the email for, I believe that was yesterday. I'm losing track of time a little bit. Um, so as we shared, we're extending the optional remote plan to include um, not just our medically vulnerable students or those that may have families with high risk households, but also families that may be just simply uncomfortable sending you know, their child to school. So I wanna speak a little bit about what you can expect in our buildings for that. So for students who are in the optional remote, 
there will be a designated remote instructor. So there will be an individual that this, these, these students will be working closely with, and that'll be hand in hand, sort of tandem, almost like a co-teacher with the classroom teacher that you have already been assigned to. So if your child is a first grader and they've been assigned, let's just say Dawn Drace, they will have a remote instructor and they will continue to be attached to the 1DD classroom because it's going to be hand in hand. That, that individual, our designated remote teacher, will be working really closely in the school building with our first grade team or with our second grade team. We are hiring multiple individuals. So they will be two teams or two grades, excuse me, assigned to an instructor. So at this time, kindergarten and first grade will have one instructor, but they're not going to be taught together. So I don't want to confuse you with that. So students will remain assigned to their class, as I was sharing, on their in-person days. So if we, you know, our numbers right now, I know that keeps coming up. I don't, I have, don't have the screen open, but as of yesterday, I, I believe it's changed. There were 16 students that were interested in the optional remote plan. So on one grade, if there were three or five, or maybe it becomes 20, they become a cohort. So that's the only thing that will change. If you were cohort two, you may now be cohort one. We needed to group them together. Um, the designated remote instructor for that in-person day, if they're cohort one, I'm going to share a chart in a minute. For the day that they're getting in-person, it's with that remote instructor. So you will receive a schedule. It will be paced across the day. Yes, your child will, for attendance purposes, need to be able to participate. If you're opting into this remote plan, they need to be able to participate in the live instruction on that in-person day. On the home learning day, they will participate in the class they were assigned in Google Classroom with the work that has been assigned there, the asynchronous instruction that instructor will be working with the other grade on that day. We have flip-flopped it. And we wanna make sure that what we're offering is comparable. So this is comparable to those students who are coming in in person, they're getting 50% in person, they're getting the other days asynchronous at home. Same thing for our optional remote learners. You'll be getting 50% a day in person, and then you're gonna have the other home learning day. So it's, it's very comparable and it's equitable, um, but there will be a teacher. And, and I almost envision it as, as a new class, because if you're opting into this, your child's not coming into the school building. So we can create community with the handful of students that are part of this group. Once we know the numbers, we'll be able to have a morning meeting with this group. We'll be able to um, think of ways to make this group feel connected with one another through small group work, or this will be done with that designated remote teacher. And then again, because the pacing, this teacher's working so closely with Don Drace or with Melissa Wagner or Anna Cortese or any of the teachers on the grade, they're going to be delivering the, the lessons that would have been delivered in person at school. Then on the home learning day, your child will go into Melissa Wagner or Don Drace or whatever Google Classroom where that remote teacher is a co-teacher on, they'll be you know, able to access the materials there too to do their work at home. There may be times if you're in the optional remote learning where we need you to come pick up materials. We certainly will be passing over the math resources, um, the supplies ordered. So all of that will be coordinated once we have who has you know, requested, we will confirm. We know that some of you put it in as interest, but perhaps didn't know you were fully committing. So at the end of day Monday, and we have that list, we will be reaching out by building to um, ensure that you are indeed participating in the optional remote so that we can then coordinate with you, your child's schedule and um, any next steps as we are preparing um, for school opening. So if you look at the table here, you see an example of if you're a kindergartner who's in remote Mondays and Wednesdays, you would be working with the remote instructor. Tuesdays and Thursdays, you would be doing the home learning attached to the classroom you were assigned. If, um, by, for some reason, if, I'm gonna clarify for those, the various options around when you would exit, let's say your hybrid model. So if you're here 
um, participating in the hybrid model and there's a quarantine or a reason that your child is unable to come to school, they will enter this remote learning plan with this group for the days that they're home so that the continuity continues for their learning. And then when they're cleared for, you know, to return, they will be able to go right back into the classroom that they were assigned when they were absent, let's say for two weeks, to be back with that class. And I shouldn't even use the word absent. They're never really absent because they're in this remote learning plan should they need to leave for health reasons. If you're opting in to the optional remote learning, you are selecting this for the trimester. So the letter that went out yesterday shared those dates. So it's very difficult for us if a child is home to then plan for them to come back because we're looking at space, we're, we're looking at a lot of logistical pieces. So if you're opting into this, it's for the, the it's a commitment for the trimester. So that would mean till um, December 9th. That's the first trimester in our buildings. Um, and then the second one is March 23rd, and then it's the end of the school year. So there's, there's three chunks of time throughout the year. So if you go into this um, optional remote plan, you're committing to that. And at the end of the trimester, there would be an opportunity to express if you are interested to then um, enter the school building and be have in-person at school. And if that's the case, at this time, we see you going back into your original class placement assignment because that, that space um, will be there. If things change, we'll certainly communicate that well in advance. But right now we see, we see that maintaining the same um, assignments. Tara, we have a few we have a few questions about um, orientation under the ORP um, for kindergarten, and then a question about um, I guess lunch and recess. We could hold that one to the end, but I guess um, we might the one about K four orientation is what type of orientation will incoming K students in the ORP receive? Sure. And I think a lot of those details were, you know, this week we're we're really flushing out a, a lot of that and, and working, working hard. I had team leaders in this week today too, working on signage and going through all of our, our procedures and giving input. So it's it's a lot of those details um, we're still working out and we'll be communicating them in advance. Um, I I imagine that rather than having your child, if they're not going to be coming into the school building at all and they're going to be doing the optional remote learning then we would want to tweak orientation because orientation here at daniel warren is helping students feel comfortable with knowing where their classroom is knowing um the the routine for going into the bathrooms you know and obviously we're going to be teaching into the to the new procedures it's you know a build of community building so you know our, our classroom routine so that'll look different for them so i still would imagine that we're providing that, but we're doing that with our remote instructor. I mean, we're going to have important conversations to have with these students. Like, what are the best practices when we're having live instruction on our computer? Like, we want to make sure whether it's not using a virtual background or making sure we're, we're, we're ready and we're in a learning spot that makes the best you know sense for us. We want to make sure it's not time where we're having breakfast. You know, that was done. So it's going to be the same expectations um, for, for the remote the optional remote learners as for school. So orientation though has different purposes. You know, we wanna make sure that they're getting to see who are your um, teachers for specialists, like meet Ms. Kowalczyk, meet, you know, you know Coach Fazio. So all the stuff we would be doing here, we would tweak it, um, but we, I, I don't think it would make sense. You know, you're certainly, you can reach out to me for, for this information in terms of your opinion, but I don't see us wanting to think about kids coming in at this point. If there's a lot of remote, optional remote learners that are going to re-enter later at another uh, trimester point, we have to think about that. What does re-entry look like for them? Do we want to have an, a half day? And then we, we can talk about that, at, you know, as closer to December, if, if you know, we're monitoring the situa situation. Um, but at this point, it's probably going to be some opportunity on the same days where you're meeting your remote instructor, helping them get to know you, and she's going to be getting to know um, you're going to be getting to know her as well. She's also going to be getting to know everything we know about your child in terms of previous assessments. You know, we're, we're going to make sure there's a lot of communication so everyone is ready to really um, support students right on day one. Uh, 
and I'm going to answer this next question. So we did receive a few inquiries if our um, remote learning instructor is going to be certified, and the answer is yes. Anyone that we hire will hold a New York State uh, teaching license, and we were also asked why. And so the rationale for it is, and we're going to talk about the idea of opting back into um, in-person learning, whether under hybrid or if we ever fully open. Um, but we want to maintain the integrity of those classrooms that we've built. Um, you know, class placement at both Daniel Warren and Effie Bellows are really super thoughtful, collaborative processes that take place with teachers and psychologists and every single person that's in the building. So we want to be able to maintain um, that that co the cohort structures that we've provided. So if a student goes back into that cohort, but also the ability to have them return back into the classroom that's initially been established and identified for that for that child. Um, if Tara wants to add on, she she may. No, we just have a question, which I, I don't think I actually touched upon in the scenarios. If you start um, in the hybrid model and for any reason you are uncomfortable um, and or things change and you need to go um, the optional remote learning plan, that does exist. So so you can start in person and then express um, your your request to do remote. But um, once you're remote, your your reentry is at the the new trimester. Um, have we hired? We are currently in that process right now for for those individuals. Um, and you know we hope to have that set in place very very soon. I'm trying to see if there's anything else. Um, um, if if yeah, I was gonna say ENL uh, under full remote ENL will be available. Uh, you know, based on the guidance, we're we are to provide students with their instructional units of study there. And um, uh, Diane Santangelo is going to get into uh, special services in ENL later. But the answer would be yes. We'd have to make uh, the accommodation to ensure your child receives uh, their mandated service. And as Mary Lanza shared, um, we're going to provide parent resources um, for you to understand Google Classroom and, and teachers are going to um, be setting them up. But there will be a way for a child to keep track, you know, sort of organize and, and have their own um, ability to, to, to submit. But also teachers could share classroom charts on there, resources on there, links to things. So it will be a place um, for, for much of that still. If, if you feel like there's something and your child needs a separate chart, I mean, that would be something we could teach into because again, they'll have a remote you know, instructor. We imagine part of orientation is helping kids log into Google, like using their, their new um, login. So we're gonna help do that in person. So for the remote instructor, they're going to be showing them, you know, sharing their screen and saying, do you see where this is? You know, this is how you're going to find it. So we're going to have to, you know, a lot of September has always been about routines. We know to have a really successful year, you have a really strong September around routines and expectations. So that'll be, that'll be the same. We'll just have new, new routines that we have to add to the instruction. Mary, can you clarify? I think, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, in Google Classroom, let's say the teacher is assigning assignments to students. Students, when they log in, are able to see what assignments they've handed in, what they're what they haven't completed, right? When they or am I incorrect? No, you're right. Um, there is on the side, and this is one of the videos that we're going to put up. But on the side of their Google Classroom is a to do area, um, and there's also a you know work area. So you can click on a couple of tabs and see either what's been turned in or what has not. We also have the ability to turn on um, guardian summaries where parents, in addition to, because they will have their students um, ID and login, um, will be able to receive emails from Google, from Google Classroom about what work was done or what work was not submitted. So there's a, there's a couple of ways that students, the parents can stay in touch with what was due and what is coming up and then also what was not submitted. So those will all be in the instructional videos that we put up. Thank you, Mary. I'm getting also a lot of questions about curriculum. So with all of the models offered, the, the curriculum will remain the RINEC elementary school curriculum. So 
you know, unless you're you're stepping out of all of these options in homeschooling where that's driven, you know, more by the parent, you are continuing to do the reading units of study, the writing units of study, um, our engage math um, curriculum. So all of that is continuing the science and social studies. So at Daniel Warren, if your child is on the home learning day or if they're in the the optional remote plan, you have that those resources available to you in the Google Classroom and with the remote instructor. So you don't need to worry that you need to understand that as well. This is going to be um, able to be delivered in a way in which the teachers will be able to drive that. Um, we'll certainly share resources with you. I'm having some kindergarten parents ask about preparation. It's it's no more than than anything in the past. Read to your child. You know, any reading that you do helps them be prepared. But but that. That instruction, instruction is part of kindergarten. You know, we use foundations for um, our word study program and helping with the phonemic awareness and letter sounds. And then we use a balanced literacy model in both of our buildings. So that will be available to you. You will have resources when school starts. Pa uh, teachers will share parent letters and, um, and all of that to support um, any extension of the learning that you wanna do. I think that covers that. So let's go on to our special education students and our English language learners. Mike, I believe you might be picking up this slide and then um, Diane, uh, Mrs. Santangelo will, will come in. You are, you are correct, Tara. So uh, when, we were, when we were looking at scheduling cohorts, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were pr prioritizing the needs of our the the needs of our of our students who really need um, everyday instruction. And so, what we looked at was students who receive what we call special class service, whether it was ELA and or mathematics. Um, we had we scheduled them because we were able to within the cohorts to get daily in-person special education instruction as well as their related services and accommodations. Um, you may have spoken to the school psychologists or um, counselors um, at Daniel Warren and at Bellows regarding um, the off day, like that's what they, right, we'll call it the, the home learning day, um, and having your child just come in for the in-person special education services and then leave or at, at least at Bellows, the ability to stay for the full day with us um, making accommodations to that child's schedule um, to allow for them not to be in for the repeated uh, cohort lesson, let's say during PE or um, uh, during PE or during science and social studies. Um, so um, if you haven't had that conversation and you're a parent of a special class student, um, I know, um, Ms. Santangelo is going to um, elaborate further. For our ENL students, um, our entering and emerging students will be provided provided their required instructional units of study um, through the remote option. And uh, currently, we're looking at uh, the providers and their schedules uh, to ensure that we can do that. Just to clarify, um, I had presented this previously and the, uh, parents had a lot of confusion in terms of um, which students were we um, referring to. Um, students with an IEP or an individual education plan, not a 504 plan, um, and these would be students who are in separate, what we call special classes. Um, for either English or math. Um, these are the students that would be, it would be highly recommended that they come in every day. Um, they need that repetition. Um, and uh, they are our students with the most specific needs. Um, by now, the psychologists, as uh, Mr. Scarantino has said, um, they should have contacted all of the special class students, parents to basically review um, the need for in um, everyday um, instruction. Um, if, if parents have any additional 
questions or concerns, um, please feel free to contact your uh, building psychologist or at the high school level, uh, Christina Schlody, who is the my um, department chairperson, and she is covering uh, the high school. Um, they will work uh, walk you through any concerns and get and get clarification regarding your st student's schedule. Um, one of the things um, that I'm sure there'll be questions about since it's fairly new. Um, the optional remote plan, um, how is that going to work for their, for their um, child? Um, again, you're going to have to give us a little bit of time to work out the schedule with the related service providers uh, to um, ensure that services are provided um, to your child. Um, so we'll be in touch with you regarding that. Again, the key people that you need to stay in touch with are your building psychologists and at the high school level would be Christina Schlody, my department chairperson. All right, Mr. Scarantino. Sorry, as I stated earlier, uh, many of our before and after school programs have been suspended at this time. We did get a question about, um, because at Epi Bellows, we do have instrumental music uh, that takes place in the morning. And I will tell you that um, I will have to talk to our illustrious music department chair, Dr. Latinsky, and ask him to um, help us out here. Um, well, no pressure I, there, Mr. Scarantino, but um, I can tell you that uh, so most, uh, I should say most, but many extracurricular activities begin after the start of the school year. Um, so on one hand, we're restricting our extracurricular activities because our focus has to be on our primary mission. Um, however, we are going to provide uh, the opportunities for students that we can. So for music, uh, you know, there are, in the guidance, there were some citations regarding uh, forms of music that require uh, exhalation like singing, for example, or, or blowing into a wind instrument like a trumpet. There are plenty of forms of music that do not involve that. So if it would be possible, for example, to get our, our string program started a little bit earlier, um, or maybe some of our percussion groups, uh, we're going to do that. But uh, once we get school started and we have our, our base program in place, then we're going to look at analyzing what kind of extracurricular programs we can safely offer to our students. Thank you, sir. Uh, we also want to remind families that uh, although some of those before programs at the buildings have been suspended, um, we still do have the early morning care program that we've partnered with the Rye Y, uh, both at DW and FEB. Um, you can find those applications under the reopening tab, uh, there's also the child care application as well. So if your child is participating in the um, early morning care, the supervision, um, you can expect the same protocols. When the doors open for them, they will be doing the health screening and the temporal scan, and um, they'll be in a, um, a location distanced until we're able to bring them to their classroom. So um, more, more can be asked uh, regarding that directly to those programs um, and they'll follow up with me as well as needed. Before we go on to the next slide, I just wanna, I have a few questions that are coming in. Just wanna make sure. So so those of you that are looking for, as, as Mr. Scarantino shared, options for the hybrid days, um, you know, the RIY keeps, there are programs that are offering for those days as well as um, after after school care. I think that's most of it for now. So I, before we close, I, I'm looking across all of our questions and monitoring the emails and um, we're all doing the same here online. I wanna make sure that you know that more information is to follow from Mr. Scarantino and I in the district. So closer to reopening, we'll send the arrival dismissal procedure. So you have that you know, at your fingertips. Um, 
we are offering conversations that were sent in the placement letters or you'll receive an email with the link from us just to further go over those opening days. Um, we can continue to reflect and look at our plans for the next couple of weeks until we open, understanding that you know this is fluid as we work through it and experience how it how it comes to play. If there's any other questions that we haven't asked, please go into the Q and A email. I see one. one. There's, a, there's a couple that I'd like to uh, to respond to, um, and you know, forgive me if I'm repeating anything, but. Uh, uh, does the hybrid model have an end of, end date, or does it depend on on the governor? Um, probably the the latter. I think um, right now we're starting hybrid, and the basics uh, of that is uh, that's to keep our students socially distanced. So I would think that um, if we if we sustain that and don't have to close temporarily, then um, you know, the governor would make some sort of a decision that would go through the department, New York State Department of Health and the state education department and and the, you know, perhaps the socially distant um, restriction would be lifted uh, and things would change. Uh, so we're going hybrid right now. That does not have a specific end date. And uh, and yes, decision making you know, would come from above. Uh, sticking with socially distanced um, i have a couple of questions regarding all right let's see uh okay. i guess air and health we had i think two questions related to or what happens in the winter are you going to have the windows open now i'm a little biased i work at the middle school high school so we have uh you know 11 through 14 year olds um our our windows are frequently open year round um, I go back to something I said during our secondary presentation for middle school and high school. And the question was, well, during the screening process, while the kids are waiting to come in, what happens if it's raining? So this is one of those uh, those questions where, you know, we go to, you know, well, what's the easiest way to deal with that? Uh, if the kids are outside lining up in the rain, they should be equipped for standing outside. That could mean a raincoat. That could mean could mean an umbrella. Um, our kids inside during the winter. Now, keep in mind, we're not going to have lockers, so our kids are going to be uh, carrying their coats with them. So, number one, this is a learning process. So, over the next few months, we're going to find out a lot more about existing with 10 to 12 kids in a classroom with open windows to make sure there's act adequate ventilation. We do have time to learn things before the weather changes and we have to worry about temperature. However, I, I would say uh, with, with, with winter clothing on hand that your child may have walked to school in, we keep the windows open. And I, I'm not talking about five below, okay? I'm talking about, you know, chilly, a little bit cold. Uh, your, your kids will put their, their coats on. Maybe we relax our hat rules. They wear a hat so that they're comfortable. Um, that's my answer right now. But again, that, that could change. A couple more health-related questions uh, about temperature checks, uh, about the reliability of temperature checks. So any of the measures that we have in place in isolation, has isolated value, but we're not doing that. We're not just socially distancing. We're not just wearing masks. If it was masks and we didn't have to social distance, then we, we would have all the kids in school, for example. But we have layers of measures to keep your children and to keep our staff safe. So a, a temporal scan alone is, is not going to, to change everything. It is but one measure that we use. So we're not solely relying on, on temporal scans to tell us whether or not a student is safe. There are, there are other, other pieces to that. Another question regarding that is, uh, well, what if after a long walk, my, my child's uh, you know, heart rate's elevated and they're a little warm and then they get their temperature checked? Um, you know, I was actually talking with our athletic director, Mr. Segley, about this yesterday because um, you know, he, he told me this is something that you may expect after uh, aerobic activity, like riding a bike. Um, 
kids can wait in line. Uh, I am I am not going to be in any hurry to have a child quickly step up and get their temperature checked. That's you know the 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 idea behind this is not a, a, a gotcha. It's to try to get an accurate temperature. So if a child has just rode in on their bike with a helmet on, which is what they're supposed to be wearing, would I expect their forehead to be a little warmer? Yes. So they wait. And then we do it at a time when their, their heart rate decreased. Uh, some more health questions um, regarding uh, communication and if someone tests positive. So uh, New York State has always had a process in place for dealing with and communicating about uh, diseases and other health issues that come up in schools. Uh, the most common thing that we deal with that is an analogy is lice. Obviously, it's not as a, a severe as severe an issue, but the process is the same. So if someone in your classroom has lice, you get notified that your child may have been exposed to someone with lice. So we will do the same thing. We don't necessarily tell you who, if you're in a classroom with 12 other kids, it doesn't, uh, you're not gonna be told that, uh, you know, uh, Eric who sits in the third row, second seat, he's the one with COVID, but you would, you would be notified that someone in your child's class tested positive or had to quarantine. So there, there would be notifications that would uh, give you the information, but also respect a family and a child's uh, health privacy. Right, similar to the LICE protocol, right? Yep. Uh, uh, with regards to, go oh, ahead, Mike. Sorry, we do have a question about Chromebooks at FEB and the, I guess the bringing them back and forth. Yeah, can I, uh, Mike, can I can do a favor? Can I just finish with the, uh, the, the health questions? Or yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, uh, sir. If a, if a parent were to be traveling out of a quarantine zone and come home, let's say two days ago, they would have to quarantine, but their child would not. So just because a family member may be quarantining does not mean that another family member can't go out or come into school. If a, if a child has a sibling that tested positive for COVID, they would have to quarantine. So if you have multiple children and one tests positive for COVID, you know, the, the one has to stay isolated and the other one have to, the others have to stay in the house quarantined. Um, i to look through all these, make sure I hit them all. Uh, quarantining and, and remote option. So the, the option of remote, remember, is, is by, by parent choice. So if the, uh, if the child has a medical, uh, is at risk medically, or if they are uh, just uncomfortable coming in. However, if a child is forced to quarantine, in other words, they get sick and they have to stay home for 14 days, then an apparatus fits well. So they would do that. So the, the child who has to quarantine and stay home would go home. They would get uh, remote option style instruction. But then when that child is medically cleared, they can come back. Mike, go ahead. And I'll have Mary uh, help me out here a little bit, but I think um, I can help provide the answer. So it's if the student is assigned the Chromebook, do they have to bring it back and forth if they have a device at home that they can access? Um, I mean, I'm not totally against the idea that we leave them in the large charging station as long as it's labeled and identified that it's that student's um, Chromebook if it's gonna lessen the burden of carrying something back and forth because Google, you can log on, Mary knows this, right? Everyone knows this. You can log on to your Google account anywhere on any device. Um, but if, if Mary, if you're thinking of any logistical thing that would impede us from allowing that? Um, no, I mean, we'd have to talk about making sure that we had, um, enough chargers available for how many students would want to do that option. And then just making sure that it's in their classroom with the doors locked. 
The only thing is then it's, we also have the students who are now in the next day in contact with the devices of the children who were in the previous day. Yeah. So we, we just might want to talk about exposure. Yeah, wanna, yeah, I think one of the things once Tara and I, um, you know, we talk about math in sync, right? One of the programs that we bought, it more than likely is going to allow students not to have to carry the heavy Eureka uh, workbooks in their backpack every day. Those may be able to stay in the classroom. I'm not sure yet, but everything that that they would be doing in the workbook can be done in that math and sync program. Um, so I think we I just, um, with that. our Edutech team just chimed in, and they would prefer if we if the students did bring them back and forth because we don't know if we have enough chargers to support that. Got so it. we the Edutech team just chimed in. They would prefer if the devices do go back and forth with the student. We know that's um, you know, something heavier to carry, but we, you know, we prefer that the devices do, you know, go home with a child and then come back with the child. Yeah. We'll look to see what will limit what they need to carry back and forth in those uh, backpacks if we have to. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Edutech and Mary. It's a question regarding, um, it's really regarding differentiation. It's, it's about a kindergarten. It's, it's from a kindergarten family, but I, I can um, share that it applies to all grades they're um they're referring to the pacing and what if some students demonstrate mastery and i think a lot of those questions come up in in any scenario certainly our our hybrid models make it a bit trickier but our curriculum allows for students to be working um, with high cognitive engagement so if your child is coming in as a reader for kindergarten that's great um, for those that are, are ready readers um, that works too we match students to um, books at their independent reading level. We teach strategies that they will apply at a book that's at their independent level. So a lot of the lessons will be transferable for many of our students. Um, and then those there, you know, there's students at the extreme ends that we um, need to support and we'll, we'll do that once we know your child better. And that's the case um, every year. And we'll, you know, continue to talk about how we do that as the year progresses in many of our principal conversations and newsletters um, and with teacher support as well. But we certainly make sure that students are engaged. Uh, we do have one more question about if a child goes to the nurse and is determined to have COVID, uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to determine if the child has COVID. So I guess I'll elaborate on the procedure here. So what will happen is if a child goes to the nurse and is having symptoms where we need to put them in the isolation room um, for, for further evaluation and a uh, phone call to the parent. The nurse will be um, the person who will be, I guess, in our isolation room uh, with students. Um, so it, as much as you feel they'll be isolated and scared, they'll be there with, with the nurse. And the other students are bumps, bruises, scrapes, and those, those sorts of things. Um, will be managed by uh, someone in the office staff, including uh, the principals. I'm sure Tara has taken care of enough bumps and bruises and uh, bloody noses, same here. Um, so as we know the volume in that room, you know, the nurses in, uh, in the office will be communicating to ensure that our kids that do have to stay in that isolation room uh, to for further um, evaluation are comfortable and, uh, feel safe because our nurses, they do a great job of that. So, um, no, I think that'll be covered. Question just came in um, just for more clarification on the, um, it's being referred to virtual learning. Our children are off. So in the spring, they felt the, the students finished a bit early and it felt light. So on the virtual days, on the hybrid model, so the home learning days, um, in terms of the content and time requirement of the work on the virtual day. So on the home learning days, the asynchronous learning in the hybrid model um, versus um, the experience in the spring. I think we all learned a lot from the spring and we were all learning along the way and, and we still are, but I imagine um, that that won't be the case, um, certainly because the continuity of home and school is, is happening every other day. So the students are receiving um, feedback greater um, and there's a different level of accountability but we'll make sure that in google classroom daily there will be instruction in the core subjects certainly reading writing math and foundations and there'll be opportunities for um, extensions so we will provide um, samples of, of schedules and how your child can pace out their day we want to make sure they're spending 
time um, independently reading, time practicing math skills, um, not just completing the sheet. So we know it's not easy, but um, to manage from home, but we will certainly um, provide um, a developmentally appropriate day for them. Um, but we do ask that if it works best, like they, they need that break time, they, they get it in school, they get snack, they receive recess, they have their lunch. So, you know, breaking that up for them and then saying, okay, now we're going into this part of our day, we'll have that mapped out in Google Classroom for you. Um, but we certainly know some students have different work styles, but we'll, we'll try to support you as best as we can with that. So, all right, well, on that note, I'm going to wrap things up. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I want to, I want to thank my, my fellow presenters, but uh, to, to kind of piggyback on what uh, Mrs. Goldberg is saying, we did learn a lot from last spring, um, and, and certainly we had uh, you know, many parents expressing how, you know, a lot of aspects of, of asynchronous and independent learning suited their child well. Uh, but on balance, uh, you know, I want everyone to know, we, we certainly heard the feedback about the need for more live face time with teachers and more contact. So everything we've designed has been to maximize that to the greatest extent possible. So our, our, our hybrid plan, uh, but, our, but our full remote plan, which really mirrors what we did in the spring, uh, shows a, a dramatic increase in the, in the amount of face time with each teacher. So when you look at what we're doing now, uh, we are technologically uh, much better prepared to begin this year. Uh, our staff training has been greatly increased. Our buildings are better suited at this stage uh, with a lot of enhancements. Uh, our schedules have been built so that they're flexible and we can move back and forth between hybrid and remote if, if we have to. Um, and you know, with the, with the example of the recent, recent addition of the, the optional remote plan, uh, you know, I think that's a, a demonstration of, of flexibility and how we can adapt. So I, I really wanna thank our parent population for, for being so supportive and giving us, you know, not only not only praise, we always appreciate that. Um, we have a, a, a lot of people uh, in this organization from top to bottom that have worked uh, really hard on, on getting this done. And there's a lot of important work still to be done. Um, but we really appreciate that the questions and the, the forward thinking, you know, there, there are questions that are coming up that, uh, that really involve things that might happen in, uh, in several months. So the, the, the sooner we can think about those things, the better. So we, we do appreciate the, the questions and the support. So uh, to close, we're, we're getting closer to September 8th. Uh, you will be receiving, receiving more communication from our district, from your individual schools, and of course, eventually your teachers, because our, our staff is, uh, is due back in soon. Um, even though they've they've been working throughout the summer hand in hand with us, um, so please be on the lookout for more communication. And I want to thank you for participating today.